So um, I'm here to listen to Mark's uh, presentation. Uh, it's a real, ple uh, real uh, pleasure for me to, to introduce uh, Professor uh, Mark Armstrong. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Committee on Industrial Economics of the Spanish Economic Association. Um, and when we learned that we had the opportunity to propose uh, an I.O. Uh, plenary session here in, in, in Symposium, one of the first names that came uh, straight ahead into our minds uh, was the, the name of Mark. And I will tell you why. Mark is a professor of economics at uh, UCL. Uh, and he has served as editor of uh, the Review of Economic Studies, uh, the Run Journal of Economics, and the Journal of Industrial Economics. His research papers have been published in journals such as Econometrica, Review of Economic Studies, Journal of Political Economy, Journal of the European Economic Association, the Run Journal of Economics, Journal of Public Economics, Journal of Industrial Economics, etc. He has uh, also held, uh, quite recently, an ERC advance grant, and his research in I.O has been out, out, outstanding and sometimes uh, path-breaking. More precisely, and among others, he has studied firm and consumer behavior, consumer search, and pricing decisions by platforms and multi-product firms. Uh, actually, the uh, pricing by multi-product firms is the title, or he has recently modified it, but, uh, the, uh, of, of, Mark, uh, talk, uh, of Mark's talk today. So if I would uh, have to highlight uh, one relevant feature of Mark's uh, research, I would say that it has the virtue of tackling microeconomic uh, problems from novel and original uh, perspectives. We can find in his research a smart mix between originality and capability. In other words, uh, Mark uh, has the ability to call into question the standard approaches and force, and force ourselves to think in a different way. So thank you, Mark. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and for the very overly generous words of introduction. Uh, uh, I've never been to this beautiful city before. Uh, I'm looking forward to looking around a bit after, the, after I finish. Uh, and thank you for coming here rather than looking around the beautiful city yourself. So uh, that's much appreciated. Uh, yes, yeah, so this, this is going to be a talk about multi-product pricing. That, uh, as was said, the previous title was something like uh, pricing by multi-product firms or something like that. But then I realized that was exactly the title of my PhD many years ago. <laughs> so I, I haven't made any, uh, any real progress at all, really. But uh, anyway, so I slightly modified the, uh, the title. Uh, it sounds rather grandiose, and, uh, uh, but you'll see, you'll see what's uh, going on. So I was trying to think of a hook, a Spanish hook, uh, you know, just to sort of, motiv to, to sort of get you uh, interested and uh, as a theorist it's quite hard to link anything to a particular country but anyway one of the very best economists uh, Francis Isidro uh, Edgeworth is actually half Spanish uh, maybe you all maybe you all know that I don't know but uh, if not you should claim him as as part of your heritage because there aren't that many 19th century uh, famous Spanish economist that I'm aware of. So you can, uh, you can take him over. His parents met in the British Museum, uh, just having a look around. Uh, they met in the British Museum and eloped and were married uh, three weeks after they met. Uh, uh, so it's a sort of romantic story and one of the results was this great uh, economist. Okay, so that's, the, uh, that's my Spanish uh, motivation. Uh, he looks quite, he looks like a Spanish aristocrat as well, to my uh, mind. As well. but, uh, uh, so what, what, what sort of thing, let me get my phone out, there's no clock here, so, uh, uh, fine. Uh, so what, what, what can I talk about here? Well, you know, it sounds a bit specialised, but there's lots of multi-product topics 
we can talk about, okay? And people have talked about them uh, over these many years. So common things would be price discrimination across markets, product bundling and uh, nonlinear pricing. That was, in fact, the topic of my PhD. Uh, these are all intrinsically multi-product questions. You can't talk about a single product firm doing these things. Another intrinsic multi-product thing is this theoretical possibility that you might do better to offer random products, like uh, not tell someone where the, which hotel they're going to get when they book it, but tell it to them after they've bought it. That kind of fancy... Uh, that kind of fancy selling procedure is something that only is beneficial in a multi-product context. Big issues to do with substitutes versus complements. Uh, in particular, you might get below cost pricing as an outcome uh, when you have complements. Uh, so something else I've worked on in the past is sort of platforms and uh, two-sided pricing. And a big thing you get there is... Uh, pricing low to one side in order to exploit the other side. So that's a, a classic example. Uh, cost pass-through isn't intrinsically to do with multi, multiple products, but it's particularly interesting in when you've got multiple products, and that's going to be something I'm going to focus on in this talk. You've got issues of choosing how, what range of products to offer, uh, high quality, low quality, all of that kind of thing, brand proliferation, uh, and another thing I'll come back to is search frictions. You know, you've got your, your a firm selling multiple things. You could arrange things so people see things, some things more easily, and they have to go and search upstairs to find something else or something like that. So that's going to be a multi-product thing to do with possibly introducing or having search frictions in how you sell. So uh, choice architecture uh, uh, would be the top topic there. So... Um, this analysis can all get pretty complicated. Uh, and one thing that people have done over the years is sort of resort to particular simple functional forms, linear demand, constant marginal cost, that kind of thing. Uh, that's tractable, but I, I'll try and persuade you that it's really misleading as a way of doing things, okay? Uh, so what I'd like to try and persuade you is that there are things we can do to simplify this complicated stuff. I'll try and uh, give you a few examples of how it could be simplified, and in particular, how you can get more insight. Uh, at the moment, it's a pretty opaque area. You know, what, what's the intuition? Our intuition is very badly developed in this area, uh, and hopefully we can find ways of getting a firmer and more realistic intuition in this is these sorts of markets. So that's the intro. What am I going to try and do? Uh, well, I'm going to, uh, if my timing's approximately right, I'm going to try and do three things. Uh, so there's this paper by Edgeworth, uh, which is, uh, actually, I was, I, my, my math was wrong. It's not 125 years ago. It's 126 years ago. But anyway, it's not... It's, that's the source of my title. Uh, and we, essentially all, all what I'm going to be saying is joint work with my regular collaborator, John Vickers, in Oxford. And we uh, had a recent paper which revisits this old paper. I'll explain that. Uh, and the aim of that is to try and work out what are the relationships between prices and costs in a multi-product firm. Secondly, uh, another slightly less old uh, uh, economist, Ramsey, no Spanish connection that I know of, uh, and he had, a, among many things, he had a, an insight that if you, what's the best way of generating, you know, if you've got, you're trying to generate a certain amount of revenue by taxation, say, what's the least distorting way of generating a certain amount of revenue, a classic public economics question, uh, and his insight was that you shouldn't increase all prices e equally, but you should try and reduce all quantities equally. Okay, so that's the more, and uh, he's, he found a case where that was exactly right, and we're going to, again, revisit that situation. And our aim in that paper was really to find a simple class of demand systems which make 
multi-product pricing question is easy to understand. Uh, and thirdly, uh, uh, I want to show how you can uh, simplify uh, the really complicated world of search frictions, where people search through a firm sells multiple products, and it has to search through to find which one they like. And I'm going to show you how you can convert that dynamic, fiddly problem into a static, discrete choice problem. Okay? So that's three ways of, basically three ways of sort of simplifying complicated problems is what we're, what we're doing here. So, uh, Edgeworth paper, that's the second paper in this list of contents here. So, he was a polymath, he wrote in Italian, uh, so this is a, an Italian paper in, I don't, the GDE, is that a well-known acronym? I don't know, but this is uh, the, I guess it's the Economist Journal, is that what it means? Uh, the Economist Journal, okay? <laughs> So this is at the very birth of modern microeconomics, uh, and, and he tackled a, uh, he decided to tackle a, a really complicated, you know, he had all of these possible things he could look at, simple things like price discrimination, but instead he decided to look at this really complicated problem uh, and uh, made some progress. Okay, so what did he do? So what is, I haven't really said what the paradox is yet. The paradox is you've got a multi-product firm and you decide to levy a tax on the supply of one product. Is it possible that that could cause the firm to reduce all of its prices, okay, including the one that's now got the new tax on? Clearly, that's not possible in a single product context. If you levy a tax on a single product firm, it's just going to raise its price, or at least it's certainly not going to reduce its price. Okay, so this is particularly a particular feature of multi-product supply, uh, uh, and uh, it is indeed possible, uh, and he's got this amazingly inelegant example uh, which uh, shows it. Uh, so this this is, remember, this is all, you know, well before the time of numerical analysis or anything like that. So he somehow just uh, uh, used, it was unusual in those days to have inverse demand. So he's got prices in terms of quantities supplied. It's a perfectly valid uh, demand system. It does have the symmetry of cross effects, which, you know, it could easily have gone wrong, but he got it, he got it right. Uh, and he argued that if you increased, now I can't remember which one it was, I think increased the cost of product one, it would reduce both prices. Okay, I don't think there's much scope for intuition there. Uh, uh, so, Hotelling, another excellent uh, economist, he, ha he, he came up with this slightly more transparent example of the paradox, which is a discrete choice example. It's, it's like a double discrete choice thing with four discrete types of consumers. And again, he probably sat in his office for hours and hours trying to get this kind of example. This is the example he came up with. So you've got four types of people. Think of it as first and second class rail travel. So the value of the first class is uh, always more than the second class, and people are faced with a pair of prices. They decide whether they want to buy anything or one of the two, uh, one of the two ticket types. And again, if there aren't many possibilities here, if you just sort of crank it out, you can see that if there aren't any costs, the most profitable thing is tr price of 12 for first class travel and eight for second class travel. Uh, and then if you had to really whack up the tax on first-class travel, you have a tax on seven, so that means the cost of supplying a first-class ticket goes from zero to seven. Uh, that makes first-class travel actually less profitable per person than second-class travel, and both prices optimally fall uh, to 11 and six. 
Okay, so he, Hotelling was actually very dismissive of this example. He said, no, one, no, no reader is going to like this kind of discrete, not discontinuous example. Uh, and he came up with another really complicated continuous example, a bit like uh, Edgeworth, uh, to, to show it. But in fact, nowadays, the modern sensibility is that we actually do quite like these simple kinds of uh, examples. So I think this example works very nicely. Um, so Edgeworth thought it was all about monopoly. Hotelling thought, showed that it could also happen in a perfectly competitive market so long as you didn't have constant costs, increasing uh, marginal costs. But what I, uh, something, uh, the really nice quote in this hotelling paper, uh, which is, you know, he was, he was saying, as, you, as probably you in the audience are thinking, this is a really improbable thing to happen. So he says, it's, everyone thinks it's really improbable. And he says, the basis for this belief seems to be that the demand functions constructed at random usually do not display it. Uh, and then he goes on to say, the construction of hypothetical systems at random depends upon irrelevant features, like the convenience and the mathematical equipment of the student rather than upon objective truth. So there are a few, there's a few demand systems we can use uh, which are easy to use. We, we trained them in graduate school, uh, linear demand and this kind of thing, and those do not, do not show this phenomenon. Uh, so I, I think this is a really nice quote, that if you can somehow expand the set of things you can work with, you've got a better, you have a better understanding of what's really going on. Okay? Uh, so, uh, I'm not going to get into many technicalities. Uh, let me see what I'm doing. So what, this, this is just a framework for most of the talk, uh, just to set up notation, really. Suppose you've got n products you're trying to sell, quantities are denoted by x, vectors are denoted by, sorry, quantities are xi for product i. The vector of all quantities is just x. Okay, it's not, it's not bold here. It's just x is just a vector of quantities. Um, as usual in industrial organization, we, all, we have quasi-linear preferences. Uh, forgive me if that's not what you like doing, but that's, that's what I've grown up with. Uh, and that just means that there's, if you like, there's a, like a representative consumer out there with gross utility, u as a function of x. Okay, that's the gross surplus to consumers when you sell a vector of quantities x to them. Okay. Inverse demand is very naturally used in this context. It's just the derivative of that utility function. It's the, in order to get, you're maximizing u minus p dot x, so the derivative uh, of u uh, gives you the inverse demand, the prices that induce you to buy quantities x. So the fact that I've got price is equal to the derivative of u means that there aren't any externalities in anything I'm going to be saying. So we're not in the world of platforms and cross-group externalities or anything like that. It's just a classical model. Okay. Uh, so what is revenue? Revenue is just x dot prices. I'm going to call that r of x. Everything's a function of quantities here. Uh, so what is consumer surplus? in this market. It's the gross surplus you get, u of x, minus the amount of money you pay out to the firm, and that's r of x. So that's a non-negative number, uh, because u is concave. Uh, and it looks, it looks simple, but I don't think it's a very frequently used concept. Okay, this is consumer surplus as a function of quantities supplied in the market. Normally we think of consumer surplus as a function of the prices in the market. Uh, and that, that function is always decreasing convex and differentiates to give demand x of p. This is consumer surplus as a function of quantities. Uh, it's not 
necessarily convex or concave or increasing or decreasing, but it summarizes lots of interesting things in this world. It's only about demand. There's no cost side yet so far. This is only about demand. Uh, so if there's one thing I'd like to push across to you is that this is a, a good way of thinking about uh, consumer demand. Okay? I'll give you two reasons for that. Complete the model with a, uh, this is a monopoly model, say, doesn't really matter, the monopoly model with a cost function C of X. So profit is R minus C. Uh, the monopoly, you normally think of it as maximizing that profit pi, but let's be a little bit more general and suppose that the, the firm also cares about uh, consumer surplus to some extent. So let's add a weight alpha to its objective. Okay, so if alpha is zero, it's just a pure profit maximizing firm. If alpha is one, it's trying to maximize social surplus, total surplus, which will entail price equal marginal cost. Okay, and alpha is the Ramsey weight. We'll talk about that shortly. Okay, so it's the Ramsey weight. Uh, what are the what are the quantities that maximize that objective? Uh, well, you, is, you, I'm not doing anything fancy here. Uh, if you just differentiate it, you'll end up with that first order condition on the bottom of the slide. Uh, and that just says that the difference between prices and marginal costs, that triangle just means the derivative of the cost function. The difference between prices and marginal costs is proportional to this derivative of S, this funny function S of X. Uh, so that says that price might be below marginal cost. Well, the only time you get price below marginal cost is when S is decreasing in that quantity. So it's a very simple way of capturing patterns of above and below cost pricing just by what's the, uh, uh, whether S is increasing or decreasing, okay? So often in textbooks you see quite complicated expressions about with things like super elasticities and complicated things like that to show when prices are above and below cost. I, I think this is a neater way, a neater way of doing it, okay? And uh, if you just delve into it a little bit more, the only way that S can be decreasing is if the product does have at least one complement in demand. One, so that it, the demand for that product is, is uh, decreasing in one other price. Okay, so that's one simplification, if you like. <coughs> uh, now we move on to edge, that was just a sort of framework. Now look at Edgeworth's problem, which is you add a tax, say, to the supply of product one. Okay, that means that it just pays the government T every time it sells a unit of product one. So it's just like an increase in marginal cost of that product. Uh, so instead of maximizing pi plus alpha S, it's pi plus alpha S minus the tax, rev tax liability it has. It's super easy to show that X can only fall after this tax. Okay, that's just, a, that's just the same thing as saying consumer demand for a, for a product always falls with a price increase. Okay, it's just the same, same thing as that. That's, that. You can't have such weird, there's no paradox which says that the, you increase a tax and output goes up. There's no paradox that can exist like that. Okay, the paradox is rather about prices, not quantities. Okay, so his paradox occurs when all prices decrease with the result of this cost rise. Uh, so one immediate thing is that it can't happen because we know that X1 goes down with the tax. So you have to have at least one pair of substitutes for it to work. If they were all complements, then, then if all prices go down, X is bound to go up. Okay, 
So, and in particular, the paradox can't possibly happen with a single product firm. Okay, so we're, we were sort of using this as a vehicle uh, to explore patterns of cost pass-through with multi-product firms. So uh, that's what the next slide is going to talk about. Okay, I'm going to talk about it in terms of linear demand and linear marginal cost. As is pretty obvious, it's going to extend easily to any smooth system. Okay, so this is just a, an approximation. Okay, so suppose you've got a, a linear inverse demand. Uh, so A is a, a, a set of intercepts and the matrix B is positive definite in order to be the uh, derivative of a concave function. The firm's cost is quadratic, constant marginal cost, uh, sorry, a vector of marginal cost plus a quadratic term. Uh, that quadratic term, call that D, as a matrix M, which is the sum of this demand and cost matrices, and that has to be positive definite so that profits are concave. So forget about D now, just think about B and M, the profit matrix and the uh, demand matrix. Uh, again, you know, it's boring to do, it's not very complicated. What's the first order condition for the profit, most profitable prices? It is, I don't know if this works, it's that middle expression there. Okay, so gamma is this matrix product. This is, I mean, it's just, they don't, it's, it's just exactly what you do. It's just a sort of mechanical formula. It's, uh, that's the matrix product, that's gamma I'm calling it. And then you work out what prices are. It's just an average, if you like, of the intercept A and the vector of marginal cost C. So remember, gamma is a square matrix. So this tells us what the matrix of cross pass-through terms is, is gamma. D P I D C J is the ith, ith J term of gamma. Okay. Uh, and the Edgeworth paradox is when gamma has a column of negative entries. All prices go down with one cost. Okay, we can, choo you know, we can choose B and we can choose M totally freely in this setup, as long as they're positive definite. So what's, what I'm trying to do is work out the feasible set of matrices gamma. And a, a matrix is a possible cost pass-through matrix if it's the product of two positive definite matrices. So that's the theorem. Okay, we can as I say, you can choose B to be anything. You can choose D to be anything, as long as they're positive definite. So we can, uh, we can ha anything is possible as long as it's the product of two positive definite matrices. So if you look at a matrix, you know, it's, if you just look at it, it's pretty hard to see whether it's the product of two positive definite matrices. I don't know if there's a procedure for doing it, but there is a linear algebra linear algebra theorem which says that gamma is the product of two positive definite matrices essentially if and only if it's got positive eigenvalues. Okay? There's a slight twist to do with not having repeated positive eigenvalues. That's what the diagonalizable bit does. But basically the theorem is it's, if it's got positive eigenvalues it is the product of two positive definite matrices. You might, think, you might think that the product of two positive definite matrices is positive definite. That's sort of roughly right in terms of the eigenvalues, but of course it needn't be symmetric. That's the problem. Okay. So here's our little theorem. Gamma is a, a feasible pattern of cost, price cost pass-through if and only if it has positive eigenvalues. Okay, so that's the way of uh, characterizing the range of price cost, 
the relationship between prices and costs uh, that you can get in a multi-product firm. The theorem carries over automatically to differentiable demand and cost. It's just a linear approximation. So again, that's the answer in that case. Okay. So as I say, the paradox occurs when there's a, a column of negative numbers in the matrix, and, that, and it's perfectly straightforward to come up with matrices which have a positive column, a negative column, but have positive eigenvalues, like that one there. Okay, it's got to be asymmetric, because if it was symmetric, it would be positive definite and would always have positive entries on the diagonal. So it's got to be, it's got to be asymmetric, uh, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the result, one of the results in the paper. Just in passing, suppose you do have linear demand and linear cost. So that means that the, the quadratic bit in the cost function is zero. Okay, so it's just constant unit costs. Then if you work out what gamma is, it's just the identity matrix, or half the identity matrix. So you have this amazingly simple formula for optimal prices with linear demand, which is that, which is, which is here. So PI is just equal to a half AI plus a half CI. And remember, this is a potentially a really complicated world with inter interdependent demands and things like that, but even so, the price only depends on your own cost. That's amazingly simple, but it's just so special, it's just not something you should base your intuition on, is what I would say. Okay, so there's a, there's a sort of sense sometimes in policy circles that anything you can show with linear demand is is, uh, that's all you need to do, but I think it is a really misleading benchmark to use. Uh, let me whip through a couple of other things. Um, so it's very common, this, this, this uh, paradox. Suppose you've got a demand system that has, we have to have one substitute. I told you that at the beginning. You have to have one substitute. Provided you've got one pair of substitutes, you can always find a cost function which gives you the paradox. So there's nothing weird about you. any demand function will do. There's nothing, you don't have weird demand to get it. Uh, so the sort of um, moral is that provided you're happy to move away from constant marginal costs, which hopefully we are, then it's very easy. There's nothing pathological about this paradox. Okay. I'm moving gradually on to Ramsey. Uh, let me have a bridging slide here. Uh, so you might think, what's the point, what's the point of this? Why, why do we care that all prices might go down uh, if, if a cost goes up? And I, I'm a bit sympathetic to that. Uh, I think the more important thing is whether consumer surplus goes up when the cost goes up. Okay, that's all we care about. We don't care about how surplus is generated. We just care about uh, the fact it goes up or down. So a sort of weaker kind of surplus pa uh, of paradox is when you tax a good, but then consumer surplus goes up. So let's call that the surplus paradox. And I would say it's more economically relevant than the, the, than the full Edgeworth paradox. OK. Uh, a very neat and what, it's just a one-liner thing, says that consumer surplus goes up with a tax T on product one if and only if the quantity of product one decreases when you put more weight on consumer welfare. So imagine you've got this Ramsey problem where alpha scales up how much you care about consumers. You've got an optimal X for each alpha. If X1 goes down, with alpha, then consumer surplus goes up with a tax on product one. Okay, so it's, in a way it's a bit peculiar for quantity to go down with alpha. You'd think to deliver more utility to consumers, you scale up demands, but of course that's, that's not always the case. 
It's a bit like uh, product one being an inferior input. If you remember your, what you mean, graduate uh, production theory and that kind of thing, you talk about inferior inputs when you increase output but you use less of an input. That's a bit like what's going on here. Okay, when does that happen? Well, it happens, for instance, if the, a, a profit maximizing firm might use more X1 than a welfare maximizing firm. That's when it's going to happen. So you've got a, you know, uh, you, sometimes you have prices below cost. That's we saw that at the beginning. The sort of quantity version of that is that uh, the firm supplies more of an output than is socially efficient. Okay, why is, why is that the case? Well, that means that X1 is, is uh, decreasing as you go from X equals zero to X equals one. Okay, and why, does that tell, why is that interesting? Well, there are lots of models where total output doesn't depend on alpha. Uh, so, for instance, the hoteling, you know, I'm using three names throughout here. The hoteling model, uh, you have one product at one end of the line, another product at the other end of the line. In lots of cases, you, you want someone to buy uh, both products, so you have full coverage. Total output is always equal to one, regardless of alpha. That means that the individual alphas have to be moving as you change. The individual Xs have to be moving as you change alpha. So one of them's going up and one of them's going down. So you're always going to have, in that hoteling model, you're going to have the surplus paradox. Okay, and a second easy example is this idea of damaged goods from a famous I.O. paper that firms introduce a more costly variant of their thing in order to stimulate price discrimination. That's socially undesirable. So that's, again, an, an example where the socially excessive use of this particular product and in that world, taxing that product would improve social, sorry, consumer surplus. So, Ramsey looks young. Uh, so Ramsey is an is a, is a amazing character. Uh, he worked in philosophy as well as economics. He translated Wittgenstein's work into English for the first time, uh, brought Wittgenstein to study in, to work in Cambridge, uh, and there's a, a, a concept, a phrase in uh, philosophy apparently called the Ramsey effect, which is when you've in invented some new philosophical concept that's interesting, and then you discover that he talked about it a hundred years ago. So uh, he, did lots of he did lots of things in economics, uh, the famous, very famous growth uh, model. And he did all this despite dying age 26. So uh, uh, a really amazing character. Uh, so Edgeworth founded and edited the economic journal uh, until his death. Uh, this paper by Ramsey was published the year after Edgeworth's death. Uh, I don't know whether there's no, we don't, we don't have any acknowledgments any, in these old papers about thank you to the editor for doing this paper or anything like that. So I don't know, but it's possible that Edgeworth was the editor of this article. Uh, uh, so these, it's fu funny looking at these papers online now. Uh, so this paper, I would say, has got no motivation. Um, it starts straight into it, and it just says that He's doing it because it was suggested to him by another economist, Pigu. So that's, that wouldn't count in the publishing something nowadays. Uh, and it's got one single reference to a, the textbook by Marshall. Uh, so that's, it makes life so much, you could, you could, you know, if you've got enough ideas, you could just uh, churn out these papers. You don't have to do all the complicated stuff nowadays we have to do to make a 50 page paper, okay? So, uh, and his problem, as I say, is what path, pattern of taxes maximizes welfare subject to a tax revenue constraint. Uh, and he says that the obvious solution that there should be no differentiation 
is completely wrong. Uh, and he says a better guide is that all quantities should be scaled down from the competitive level equally. <clears throat> and he showed that with linear demand, again, uh, that was exactly correct. Okay, so that with linear demand, the optimal policy was just to scale back quantities equally proportionately from the competitive level. Uh, and that might involve a negative tax on a product. Uh, and his example, which is a bit old-fashioned now, was damsons and sugar. Damsons is some sour fruit used to make jam or something like that, so that you could only eat damsons if you had lots of sugar. So if you might want to have a negative tax on damsons in order to stimulate the tax revenue from sugar. Okay, so normally we move on to a very closely related thing, which is what prices maximize welfare for a given level of profit. Those are so-called Ramsey prices, uh, and that's what I'm going to quickly look at here. Okay, let me skip, I'm going a bit... So, uh, we, are, we argue, it, sorry, this is a paper from five years ago, also in the JPE, uh, and this, uh, we suggest a family of demand systems which are, so that this S function, remember S is this function of consumer surplus as a function of quantity. We say, when that S function is homothetic, things work really nicely. Okay, and I'll explain why. And in particular, when S is homothetic, we get exactly this quantity, equiproportional contraction of quantities as the optimal policy. Okay, and when is, when is S homothetic? Well, it, when, it, you can show that when you can write utility in this particular decomposed way, it's a function of where H and Q are constant return functions, homo, uh, uh, homogeneous degree one functions, and G is a, a scalar function. If you can write U like that, I'll give you some examples in a second, then S is going to be homothetic. It's going to be a function only of that Q thing that's in there. Okay? So you're going to think of Q as a measure of average quantity, uh, uh, and that's, so it's a bit like homothetic demand, but as we'll show you, it's much more general. Okay, and this family has got three degrees of freedom. You can choose the H function, as you like, the G function, which is a scalar function, as you like, and the Q, the composite quantity function, as you like. Okay, so it's got three things you can choose. So we would say it's, a, it's quite a flexible family of demand systems. And what fits into it? Well, obviously, uh, standard homothetic preferences fit into it. That sort of goes without saying. That's something that people use a lot. That just corresponds to the case where H is zero. Okay, linear demand fits into it. Okay, again, it's not totally obvious, but it does fit into it. Uh, here, the composite quantity is this quadratic form. Uh, so that, that's, that's the surplus function. And what's, what's the other, so we've got what functions do we use to study multi-product pricing? Homothetic, linear, and logit. Those are the three things that we typically look at. Logit has this complicated looking demand for, form. And it also fits into this world where the composite quantity is the sum of quantities. So those are the three things, and they all fit into this family. Okay, so that's, that's the reason why these are commonly used, because they have such simple properties. Okay, but there are many more, the many, many more you could do by changing the H or the G or the Q. Okay, and they're all going to be equally easy to work with. Okay. And, uh, well, so the, let me do, I won't, let me just say, this is something I, I always like doing, but maybe other people don't. Convert the quantities into 
the sort of length of the average quantity, q of x, and then times x divided by q of x. So that's the length of the vector x, if you like, and this is the angle the quantities lie on, the relative quantities. Uh, and what's nice about, you can always do this, it's nothing to do with the family, you can always do that. But if you do that in this family, the choice of relative quantities doesn't depend on what q you use. That's the crucial thing. So it's like a, a move to polar coordinates in some general sense. Uh, and the, but when you do it in this family, the problem separates between choosing the length of the vector and the angle of the vector. And that makes it all very nice. Uh, so just come back to Ramsey's problem. That's what we're trying to work out the x that maximizes that as a function of alpha. Uh, you can choose the q of x first and then the relative quantities. That only depends on q of x because it's homothetic. And then the profit term, choose x and then choose the relative quantities. That relative quantities doesn't depend on x. And that's just exactly the same thing as saying relative quantities don't change with alpha. Okay, so that you're always just on this ray from the origin. You move outwards as alpha goes up, uh, but the relative quantities don't change. So anything in this family has the Ramsey property of, of uh, relative quantities being chosen optimally by a monopoly, which is essentially what's going on. Notice that when it happens, uh, quantities always increase with alpha. So we're in a world where quantities always increase with alpha. Uh, so we can't possibly have the surplus paradox mm -hmm. because that involved the surplus paradox when one quantity went down with alpha. Okay, so you can never get that in this family, in this family of demand systems, let alone the full Edgeworth paradox. So in sum, I commend to you this family of demand systems uh, which are very easy to work with. Whatever problem you want to do, we, we focused on a particular issue which was this uh, Ramsey issue, but you could use it to study lots of things. And we, in the paper we study corner competition as well in this setting. Very good. I've got one little, little thing to say. Have I, can someone tell me, am I working towards uh, seven minutes? Five. Five minutes. Very good. So I've got another picture. Uh, so we don't know what Pandora actually looked like. Uh, she lived a long time ago. But this is uh, the Greek myth of Pandora opening the box to release gone up. Uh, okay. You liked the picture, maybe. Okay, so uh, uh, you, you've got uh, Pandora was this Greek mythological woman who was told not to open the box because it contained all the ills of the world but did open the box. Uh, for some reason that is now linked with uh, concepts of optimal search. Uh, it was a, there are, if you look, type in Pandora opening the box into Google and get images, you'll get thousands of Victorian pictures of this act, uh, almost all with partially clothed uh, women. It was, a, it was a, a popular topic in the Victorian uh, world, okay? I don't... So there's a picture, not to go with Ramsey and Edgeworth. Okay, so in my remaining minutes, uh, so John and I did a, a paper which tried to work out which, you, you've got a demand system, you know, Q1 is a function of two prices, Q2 is a function of two prices, something like that, and you want to know whether it's compatible with a discrete choice model. Again, sounds a bit obscure, why are we doing this? I'll give you an, an example at the end, why it's a nice thing. Okay. So what does that mean? Suppose you've got a demand system here, xi, 
And we want to know whether you could find a discrete choice micro foundation for that demand system. That just means there's some random variables. Think of those as the value of product one, product two, such that you buy product one, product I, if it's got the highest net surplus compared to the others, and it's positive. So, can you find a dis can you find a uh, set of random variables that generate that given demand system? It's pretty clear it's got to be substitutes because you always have substitutes with a discrete choice model. Uh, it's got to be bounded because you know you can't have a singularity at zero, say, because that can't be something you could get in a discrete choice model. So say it's bounded, and write x as the sum of the individual demands. Okay, that's a function of the vector of prices. Okay, and normally, because it's not because it's bounded, so normalize it so that you have demand one at zero prices. You always that's the amount of stuff that's bought at zero prices. So we have a theorem that says you can find a V that generates this demand system if and only if this one minus x is like a CDF function. Okay, if it, if it was generated by discrete choice, then the people who didn't buy would be in the bottom left rectangle that v's were less than p1 and p2. So that's the CDF of v1 and v2. So that has to be what one minus x is. The much harder bit is going the other way around. That if if uh, if this is a property of a CDF, you work out what the distribution of v is. That will generate this demand function. Okay, so it's uh, pretty simple to state. Uh, and my final thing I want to do is just show how you could convert Pandora's problem into a dis discrete choice problem. So what is Pandora's problem? Uh, well, suppose you've got this multi-product retailer. It announces all its prices from the start, but you're looking through, you're trying to decide what to buy. You're trying to decide what to buy, and you have to investigate things piece by piece. You want to try on a pair of shoes or whatever it might be. Uh, and uh, a, the, the, the conceptual framework is that you, each product is inside a box, you know the distribution of your value inside the box, you know the cost of opening the box, but you don't know the realization of the match utility inside the box. Okay? So that's the, that's the situation. And you know, each consumer knows, you know, how likely is she is to like this product, what the distribution is within the box there. And her problem is to decide, given the prices, which order to open the boxes in and when to stop. Okay, and think of consumers as having heterogeneous search costs. The SI is the cost of opening box I, uh, and there's a CDF for valuations inside each box. That could all be heterogeneous across consumers. Uh, the only technical thing you need to think about is what's the value of a box, the so-called reservation value, it's just, so you've got some product in hand already. What's the value of that product which makes you just willing to open one more box? That's RI. Okay, I, the Pandora metaphor is very weak in this, I think, because we knew, we know what the, what's inside the box and it's very, very bad. So the reservation value of that box is very bad and you shouldn't open it at all. Uh, we're thinking of things where there is a positive out outcome inside each box. Okay, so just to be clear, inside each box there's a value WI, unknown, till you open it, and each box is associated with a reservation value RI, and that depends on the search cost of opening it and the distribution of values inside the box. So there's two numbers associated with each box, two scalar numbers, a reservation value and the value, the hidden value inside the box. 
uh, Pandora's rule was discovered by Weizmann, uh, by my terms, a relatively modern economist. Uh, so he discovered that recently. And the rule is that if you're going to open one more box, it should be the box with the highest reservation value. And you should stop looking uh, whenever the best thing you've found so far uh, exceeds the reservation value of all the unopened boxes. A complicated rule. So actually, quite simple to state, but it's a complicated rule. Uh, and in particular, it's very complicated to work out what the eventual demand is in this world. Okay? So, for instance, if you've got five products, five boxes, what are the different ways of buying box three? How many ways are there to buy box three? Well, you could open box three first and consume it straight away. That would be one thing. You could look at everything and then come back to box three. That would be another one. And there are 265 ways of doing it with five boxes. Okay, so it's a bit of a, bit of a mess. But we can use our theorem to work out, to convert it into a discrete choice problem where there aren't, well, there's no dynamics going on it at all. And the system is, you've got each box has got an R and a W. There's a minimum, therefore, call that B. And that B determines whether you consume box I. Okay? If VI minus PI is bigger than all the other VJ minus PJs, that's when you're going to buy box I. So you just work out in this market what the distribution of this VI is, and that is, generates the demand uh, for eventual purchase of product I, even though, the, in fact, all the consumers are doing incredibly complicated things in the shop, coming, going to the end and coming back, etc., etc. But you can convert it into a static, standard, discrete choice model, which you can do analysis on in the usual way. OK, so I'm going to arrive now. I've run out of time. Here I am. Here we are. Thank you for lasting the distance. I know you're a bit captive. Uh, what, what did I want to do? Uh, Multi-product is straightforward when demands are simple. We've known that for a while, like linear demand or linear costs. And we were, I wanted to persuade you that, in fact, there are lots of simple demand systems you could choose, not just the ones that we've been brought up on. Beyond that family, there are lots of things that can go on. In particular, that was illustrated by the Edgeworth paradox. That can go on outside that market. And I would say that this paradox is less rare, less extreme than we thought before we started this. New tools can simplify and add insight to existing problems. So recasting consumer surplus in terms of quantities was one example of that, I hope. And another one was recasting demand in terms of discrete choice. And I would say lots of good multi-product pricing questions that remain open even, uh, even more than 125 years on. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. deliberately gone over time, so there's no scope for questions. Uh, hopefully, and maybe not, I don't know. It's all so simple. Thank you, Mark. I love it when very complex uh, problems can be simplified and we advocate uh, for simple solutions um, that allow us to make a progress. So, so I think that is extremely useful. Can you mention any more um, recent example of, of you know, issues that we are concerned about from a policy side for which uh, your simplifying tools uh, have proved uh, useful to make progress? Oh, well, that's a slightly cruel question, because I, I don't really, uh, 
I don't really think about policy as much as I should. Uh, Keynes wrote an obituary of Edgeworth, uh, and he said that Edgeworth, uh, comparing Edgeworth to Marshall, and Marshall was very interested in using his powerful math techniques to understand questions of social interest. And he said Edgeworth was only interested in the, uh, the beauty of the problem he was looking at. Uh, and I'm not remotely comparing myself to either of those two, but I'm very much in the uh, Edgeworth mold of, those, of that pair. Uh, so uh, uh, I, would, uh, I would hesitate. I could, I, could give you, I could give you some detailed examples, but I would hesitate to say this is going to change the world of policy. Uh, uh, the platform stuff is more geared for that in a way. But, uh, sorry for not being better, more better at that. So you're getting a good. So it's like bounded rationality, but my consumers are choosing optimally whether to travel upstairs to get the hard-to-reach product. Uh, so it's not. I would make a distinction between. Look, it's like bounded rationality, but but, but bounded rationality doesn't wouldn't have d u, u equal p uh, as the uh, as the outcome. Okay, so thank you, Mark. Um, so thank to all of you. And with this, thank you. So good job.